today, the first day of the night. Um, we'll fix them along real for it, buddy. Um, let's see, so there's a couple things uh, I want to cover, kind of wrapping up things that I uh, left done, let's say, at the past couple lectures. So we had uh, two lectures ago talked about Hamilton and Standard Euler integrator says just 
you know, taking epsilon step in Q and taking epsilon step in P jointly uh, at the same time and just keep repeating that, where you have some, uh, and, and you know, evaluate this, uh, this, this function um, at where, whatever the current step you're at and you just take epsilon steps. If you do that, you actually don't get the detail balance condition satisfied and um, that will actually not give you a proper NCMC algorithm. Uh, one thing with the Euler method is that the argument we had that it was reversible uh, doesn't hold for that particular integrator, um, and it also doesn't preserve the volume uh, in the QP space. Okay, so so that brings us to leapfrog. Uh, the leapfrog integrator does have these two properties we want, and if you look at the uh, Radford Neal paper. You see that you initialize this thing. If I start at p of zero, so remember this is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to have a p and q in time t. So I'm, I start with some p of zero. Uh, so this starts uh, let me back up here and just say uh, you you have some initial condition uh, p of zero. Q is zero. Uh, remember, um, in, the, uh, in HMC, the P of zero that we get, the initial we get is just sampled from E minus kinetic energy, which we usually uh, choose just Gaussian. So kinetic energy is just something like uh, P squared over two type thing. There's maybe some variance to it, but. So this P of zero we got from the Gaussian, Q of zero would be my previous point in the markup chain that I sampled. Um, so that would be my initialization. Um, and then the, the leapfrog, taking a full step uh, uh, each time for P and Q. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take first a half step in P. So P is the momentum variable. We take a half step, uh, Following this equation, dp dt um, equals the, the derivative of our Hamiltonian with respect to q. It's just the gradient in q of the potential energy. Um, and we take an uh, epsilon over 2 step in that direction. So this is kind of just a discrete step in that direction, but if instead of our steps, our full steps as epsilon, we take half a step. We now kind of repeat. Uh, now this is the leapfrog part. We're gonna now that we've taken a half step in P, we're gonna leap over with a full step in Q, and then P's are gonna be at half steps and Q's gonna be at full steps. And we're gonna kind of they're gonna kind of leapfrog over each other. That's where the, the name comes from. Uh, so Q uh, at some time plus epsilon is equal to the previous time uh, plus a step. energy, um, and then we take a full step in P, oh, sorry, that, so yeah, so F, uh, P is at epsilon or two kind of steps, so we're going to take something like uh, this, We have two 
two properties. One is we have exact uh, time reversibility. So what that means is that if I start at P0 and Q0, and I run this, this uh, leapfrog algorithm out to time t, and then at the end of the thing, I'm going to take an extra half step in p, just so they're both uh, at the same integer, capital T, let's call it capital T out here. I run them out to time capital T, which is you know, some integer number of steps. Um, then if I reverse my time step direction, and just run this exact same system backwards. So I'm essentially going to just flip the signs here and go backwards in time. When I get back to time zero, I'm going to get exactly P of zero, Q of zero back. Okay, so, so e even um, though it's a uh, kind of this discrete numerical method, it gives us uh, exact Reversibility. So if you run this numerically forward and then numerically run backwards, you get the exact same uh, thing you started with. Okay? I mean, up to floating point that you get from uh, evaluating these things and the additions and so forth, but um, uh, it, it gives you exactly that backwards. Uh, the second property it has um, is that it's symplectic. So this is, uh, LeapFrog is the simplest version of what are called uh, symplectic integrators. And what that means, that's I mentioned uh, that the volume form in QP space, uh, which we use to kind of uh, argue that this was a, satisfy the detail balance condition, the volume form is preserved. So we had this argument, if you remember, we had the, the A case that map onto the B case through this, this process, and that, that has to to preserve the volume form, uh, which is really called a symplectic form in this Hamiltonian uh, QP space. And so um, you have to have these two properties for that detailed balance condition to hold. Um, if you do some, like I said, some other integrator, just uh, you do like a fancier integrator, like the Runway Cut of Four, you know, something like that, it's not um, going to give you a, a, a correct NCMC algorithm because it won't satisfy these two properties. Um, now, the, the uh, leapfrog is not guaranteed to conserve the Hamiltonian. It conserves that volume form and it has this time reversibility, but it doesn't perfectly conserve the energy, total energy H here. Um, it, it does. It does. step, and 
I'm going to again increase my, uh, or I guess probably in this case, uh, yet yeah, increase my energy um, each time. And so this keeps happening. You see in the, you see the picture in the uh, uh, paper. It kind of spirals out further and further. You just keep getting current. This uh, uh, this loss of Um, and if you think about what the leapfrog is doing, if I draw this circle again, um, why, I mean, just kind of intuitively, why is it conserving energy better? If I start here, um, and take, take a half step here, I've gone half step, has still taken me off of the circle, but now I'm going to take kind of the, the, the velocity, the change is going to be um, tangential to that, so I'm really kind of taking a secant of most here. I'm not drawing it very well. It's a little, uh, but I'm going to get a much better um, conservation there. If I, if, I, if I, my step going forward here is going to kind of take this, this midpoint. Uh, so it's similar to the midpoint rule, if you know that one from uh, in Grayers here. Um, and, and, and if you look at the example there in the, um, in the book chapter, it, 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 it follows uh, this conserving this uh, this little set much better. Uh, okay, so that's the leapfrog. Any questions about that before I move on? I'm just going to jump through multiple topics here uh, that I left off in the past couple of lectures. Any questions on, on leapfrog integrators? Okay, yeah, you're using that. That's the code uh, that in the in the Radford Neal book that does. Kind of exactly this in R. Okay. Um, right, so then last lecture. Expectation maximization, uh, complete topic shift. Um, and, and I uh, ran out of time before I could tell you, uh, just give a, the details on um, how the expectation Max, maximization algorithm looks for uh, this the kind of classical case that uh, everyone does for EM, which is uh, Gaussian mixture model. So let's just cover that, and then we'll move on to uh, the final topic for the day. Um, so just to remind everybody, what is the Gaussian mixture model? So the mixture model. We have the following picture. So we're observing data x sub i, and um, there's this latent variable z, which is categorical, which which mixture or which uh, kind of cluster, if you will, did uh, this data point come from? Was it generated from? And um, a picture like this, where we have n data points. Remember that plate notation means that's repeated n times. Um, this is in, in d dimensions, whatever dimensions you want here. Uh, I'm going to have uh, a list of means. So mu here is really, remember, a list of uh, k uh, possible means and a list of uh, k possible sigmas. Kind of think of uh, you've got a mean and a sigma. Um, you know, some picture like this in 2D, for instance. Uh, this would be like mu1, mu2, mu3, and you've got you know this sigma1, sigma2, sigma3 associated with those means. And so I've got really these three clusters, and they're just mixed together. I don't know which uh, kind of gal they came from. Um, and then z sub i has uh, a kind of of each cluster uh, being selected. So pi is a, in this case, of three clusters would be like a three vector, which is a probability vector that sums to one. Um, and it, it's the probability of the x being selected from one of these, these classes. OK, so that was kind of the uh, graphical model for the mixture Gaussians. Um, and we wrote down what the joint thing looked like. 
right? So the probability of the x and the z jointly uh, given the uh, u's, the sigmas, and uh, the pi was as a product of the dis densities for each, each x, i, z, i uh, pair. Um, so product over i. And then we had this kind of uh, tricky notation where we take a product over the, the uh, different classes we have. Um, and, and everything's a Gaussian, but so this would be like a Gaussian density function for hormone exon. But we kind of uh, had this trick to zero it out uh, by taking it to, um, or I should say, to select the proper density. Remember, zi is everywhere except for the class that uh, this xi really came from. Okay. So um, let's say if this uh, if this xi came from the uh, let's say second uh, class in this in this picture, then zi would be. Um, class, that means I would take it to the power zero. It the first class, which would basically make that density go away and just be a one in the product. Um, and then it would take the first power for the second density, and that would be the density that actually gets into the thing again. Okay? So that was kind of the trick there. Any, any questions about how it started? What's the behind here again? Uh, pi is the uh, probability of each of these. So pi is the primary. So it's going to look like pi 1, pi 2, uh, pi 3. Oh, sorry, I need a pi in, yeah, in here, thanks. I need pi to also to the ZIK. So pi is, is kind of the probability of class one, probability of class two, probability of class three. And so um, this, this pi is like the probability of z, right? If this is also being selected, which one you, uh, which uh, by the z they vary there. So this is um, okay. So this is basically multiply this Gaussian by pi k but only the one that uh, I end up selecting here. Um, so, so this is basically the multiplication rule. This is basically a P of Z here is, is the pi term, and then this term is uh, the probability of X given Z. Is this term. Right. And so the, that, that just gives the probability of X Z, and I'm going to multiply over all the um, Okay, so the whole game, remember, in uh, the EM algorithm. I have a question. Yes, Air Force. So those parameters are given or? So, uh, yeah, this is, so this is what we're going to do uh, now is uh, you don't know anything but the x's. You know, you, you, okay, so we have to fix the number for the, what we're going to number of classes k. So we pretend we know the number of classes. You know, in another lecture, okay, uh, we're not going to cover this semester, I don't think, because we're, we're out of lectures almost. Um, but but uh, in a parallel universe <laughs> lecture, I can cover um, uh, how, to, how to estimate k. But, but, but yeah, the mu, sigma, and pi are unknown parameters, and the goal here is to estimate the, the, those parameters. So that's what we're doing. Yeah, right. So yeah, so I can put a. I mean, yeah. If, I, if I'm going to be consistent with the notation I've used in class, you're right. I should. I should be sitting here. Yeah. Yeah. So so mu sigma and pi were not treated as random. Uh, if we wanted to make this a Bayesian Gaussian mixture model, uh, we would we would make mu sigma and pi random. 
tandem and mu and sigma would have the same uh, kind of conjugate distributions possibly uh, prior. Uh, the normal inverse gamma, or really if it's a covariance, it would be a normal inverse Fischart. Um, and pi would be uh, what's called Dirichlet uh, prior. Uh, and we're, we're not going to we're not going to cover that. But if you want to look that up, that's another layer of complexity we can put on this model. Um, we can also just to give you kind of a sense for how like a fully Bayesian mixture model approach. You have to put priors on all these things. And then it would be also to not assume we know k, the number of clusters here. Kind of the way we did with, uh, there's lots of ways to do it, but one way to do it, the way we looked at um, the evidence. If you remember the evidence trick in um, uh, the uh, regression, where we chose the number of polynomial coefficients by plotting the evidence, where you basically integrate over all these variables, you integrate all these unseen variables out, marginalize them. Plot basically just p of x. The, the evidence is the probability of just your data, right? And so you plot that as k, in case of an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, you kind of take the maximum evidence. Um, I'm not going to go to the details of the math there, but you can, so, so this kind of question of clustering and picking how many clusters are there in your data, you can do that uh, basically automatically with the Bayesian type approach to mixture problems here. Uh, but anyway, that, the, the details of all that I'm not going to get into, but that's a good kind of commentary, I guess, to make. Um, any other questions? OK. Um, yeah, so let's just take a look at, uh, so, so for now, we're not going you know, kind of fully Bayesian on this uh, problem. We are treating mu, sigma, and pi as parameters. Um, and uh, their constants that we want to estimate is maximum likelihood. And so remember the EM expectation maximization, what it's going to do is it's going to let us maximize the likelihood of X given these parameters uh, with Z marginalized out. But remember the, the, the motivation was that marginalizing out Z would require that we sum over kind of all possible combinations of Z's in this equation. So you have to sum over all possible assignments of data points to the different uh, clusters you have in your uh, uh, mixture, and that's you know combinatorially kind of gets uh, unwieldy quickly. Um, and so remember the idea with the EM uh, algorithm is instead of doing that. We're going to iteratively maximize something called a Q function, which uh, we saw. So I'm going to now just, as usual, say theta. Theta is um, the this, this set of all my parameters that I'm interested in. It's all these things, mu sigmas and pi. So I'm going to add uh, here's theta which depends on my previous estimate in the previous iteration, we'll call it uh, iteration t here. And we're going to maximize this q function with respect to this first parameter theta. Okay. And um, the maximum of that is what I'm going to set to be my t plus 1 uh, estimate. And, um, Right. The uh, Q function, yes, we that. The uh, Q function, just to remind everybody, was um, uh, equal to uh, the expected value. And this expected value is with respect to the posterior distribution of my latent or, or unobserved Z variables given uh, my X. Fixing the parameters posterior distribution to the parameters I had estimated in the teeth uh, previous uh, distribution, uh, previous uh, iteration. Okay. So, so this is kind of the first key thing is that I've got for my previous iteration some parameter estimate. I can get the posterior distribution under those parameters of z and x. Okay. 
Okay, so the first thing you have to do to be able to apply the EM algorithm to whatever problem you have at hand is you have to um, be able to write down what is this posterior distribution. So we're going to do that in a minute. This, um, and, and so then I take the expectation of the log of my joint distribution. So log P of X, Z joint distribution uh, given theta. And this theta is kind of a freely, free to roam uh, theta that I'm maximizing over. Okay, so their theta appears in this. One is the theta from previous iteration that that's fixed. I'm taking expectations over, and the other way the theta comes in is in the law of joint probability, which is a variable that I'm actually maximizing over uh, this Q function. Okay. Um, any uh, questions about that so far? So yeah, so that's what we covered last time. Um, and now the question is, Okay, so where I was, I broke this part down, but I didn't tell you how to now apply this uh, EM algorithm uh, to the case of the Gaussian mixture model. So that's the goal we're going to uh, try to accomplish today. Um, okay. So, uh, write down for, um, you know, so this is this is a generic equation, right? This is generic. This would work for any, you know, xz theta kind of uh, breakdown. Um, but now let's make xz theta mean this stuff over here and write it down for the specific case. So specifically for uh, Gaussian mixture models, what does this look like? Um, I'm going to stop putting this notation of the subscript just to save my hands from too much writing. So when you see an expectation, it is uh, implicitly always over the posterior with the theta t consideration parameters, okay? Um, so let's let's write down, I mean, I'm just gonna leave, uh, we'll get to the expectation in, in a little bit, but let's, the first thing we wanna do is write down uh, what is this log, of this crazy thing here. Um, the nice thing is that this is all products. Remember, the other thing I, I mentioned last time is that the other problem with doing a log C is that when you put a sum on the outside here, you can't take a log. I mean, you can't take a log, but it, it, it's hard to compute because you can't bring the log inside a sum. So that's another reason to try to keep <coughs> that sum out of the equation so far. Notice that the um, EM algorithm, the expectation is on the outside of the log, so we're going to take a log of this thing, and, and if there's no sum yet, so the, the log very nicely works for us because we can bring it inside the sum, or inside the products, and the products turn the sums. Okay, so if I write that down, um, that thing, and bring the log inside the sums, or sorry, inside the uh, products terms, the products and the sums. Okay. Uh, and I get a log of uh, the inside stuff. So, um, yeah, let me actually write. So log of pi to the z is just z, uh, let's see, i k times the log of pi
brought the log inside uh, that, that those products, and the powers came down and out of the log. Okay? And um, notice this actually has become very simple because what's our expectation of it? So as far as we're concerned, because it's only over Z, this expected value, X is constant as far as it's concerned. Theta is constant, everything else is constant. Z is the only thing that I'm doing expectation over. This is the only place Z appears, right here. So I can use the linearity of expectation to bring this expectation inside of the sum. I can pull all this term, none, none of this has a Z in it. So I can pull all of that outside of the expectation. And what I get is just the uh, double sum of the expected value of z times uh, this uh, crazy stuff. And I'll just kind of shorten that number of you to the end for the same time. OK, so, so yeah, does everybody follow that trick? Because I'm only, the expectation, the only random variable expectation is the z. And so Z is the only thing I have to keep inside the is the linearity of expectation. Is everybody happy with that? Okay, so, so now this all boils down to if I'm able to write down the expected value of Z under this posterior distribution, I can now maximize this equation in terms of pi and the uh, mu and sigma is yeah. Z, but when you say expectation with respect to Z, presumably Z is a vector. So you're asking for the expectation of a vector, so the expectation of that individual component. Yeah, so let's be, yeah, yeah, let's, yeah let, that's good to clarify here. So expectation of Z, um, Z is a vector. Um, ZI is the i data point uh, Z vector. And um, the K I've got here is selecting a component from that vector. And ZK, ZIK is really um, one of these components. So, so what I have inside here is this is just a single number. And it's a random value. It's actually a 0 or a 1. Even. So we you know this ex expected value is really a, fract a fractional kind of between 0 and 1 uh, value. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we're working with inside here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so expect value over uh, Z in this case, because the Z's only appear like component by component, or appear as a vector all together, so there's, that's kind of the way that works out. Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, okay, so yeah, so what did, how does this, Oh yeah, so uh, the, the other thing I'm going to say, so to maximize this, what we're going to do is we're going to compute this thing here uh, under that posterior distribution. And then we're going to maximize with respect to pi and then the parameters mu and sigma for, for the normal distribution. I'm going to then uh, basically take the derivative of this with respect to pi, for instance, and then set that to zero, your usual calculus trick. And then we're going to see that you can actually solve explicitly the, the, this maximization equation uh, in closed form. So our iteration in the um, EM algorithm is going to be a closed form step each iteration. The maximization is going to be closed form. Just like computing the mean of the Gaussian is a closed form maximization uh, of likelihood, this is going to, the EM algorithm, it's still iterative, but it's not one big But each iteration is a closed form. You don't have to do any um, numerical integration or Monte Carlo integration or anything like that. And it, each iteration is, is a closed form uh, maximization step. Okay. Um, so, right, so how do we get the expected value of the uh, ZIK? I'm going to call that. 
value m i k just uh, a name that's easier to write. Um, so just by definition, this is what I'm calling e z i k. Um, and it looks like the following. I need to take uh, uh, the posterior distribution. So uh, posterior distribution of z given x, it looks like uh, it looks like uh, pi k uh, <coughs> times n x i. Given u uh, k sigma k, um, this whole thing again selected with z i k, um, and then take this. This is the joint again for for x i z i. So 
to that, I'll have to rewrite this whole thing again. Um, it, so now the expected value is going to be just um, the sum over uh, the possible zik values of zik times uh, this thing that we just wrote down, this, this fraction that we just wrote down here. So the p of xi zik over p of xi. OK, so I just take this crazy fraction, plug it in here, multiply by zik, and sum over possible values of zik. Um, and then, uh, let's see, um, what I'm going to get uh, if I do this is ZIK is binary. Right, it's just one and zero. So we're going to have a one here. Uh, this, this guy's one. Um, and this. And then when I have a zero here, that term is nothing. So that uh, doesn't matter what this whole thing came out to be. And so in the end, this is just um, this numerator with a one in here uh, divided by this. So it's really just uh, the previous pi estimate times uh, the Gaussian for xi So um, in the end, that's my PMIK. And these are all things uh, that I can compute. Let's just, just be clear. Uh, so I, I, can, I can just compute these at uh, gamma IKs directly. Uh, these are just constants that I can, I've got from my previous iteration. Uh, this is just taking the data point, which is uh, always stays fixed with the whole algorithm, the data point is observed data. I just evaluate the Gaussian density function. This is just the Gaussian density function for the kth um, uh, cluster, the kth kind of uh, uh, component here, right? So what are we doing here? We're taking our current estimate of the probabilities times the x for that uh, density, and then we're 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 normalizing it by the for all of uh, densities. So what is this doing? I'm going to evaluate it. Let's say k is currently, uh, I'm currently evaluating is 2. I'm going to evaluate this density function uh, with respect to uh, the Gaussian density at 2, the second, second Gaussian, Gaussian density here. And I'm going to multiply that by my current estimate of the probability of that density. And that's my numerator. And then I'm going to divide by a sum over all three kind of evaluations of the density function for xi times their probabilities p, or sorry, pi um, of those, uh, uh, those guys, okay? So um, that's, that's, that's what this, uh, this ratio is, is kind of telling us. It's, it's the, in some sense, the weighted uh, kind of probab uh, uh, density value of uh, the case uh, cluster here. Okay, so it's like a likelihood function, 
for one of these densities, but divide it by kind of the kind of the sum of all of those. So this is sum over all possible values of C I G the denominator. Yeah, the denominator is um, so K is oh. constant there, right? Wait, so the denominator actually Yeah, that's right. Oh sorry, I need the CIJ. This whole thing is to the CIJ. No. Oh yeah. Okay. So for this uh, I I and D are constant. It's just the value of ZIJ can be 0 or 1. OK, so sorry. This um, denominator is, uh, let's be careful, uh, J, 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 this is like a, this is it's not constant. So I'm summing, I'm summing over, um, okay. I'm summing over, really, see, I should make Gamma 
MIKs, notice they are, they, because they're normalized like this, they will um, sum up to 1. If we sum over K with the three clusters. Okay, is everybody clear on, on this MIK uh, number now? Where did the sum from the second line go? Second, what's with this, this line? Yeah, where did that sum? So here, yeah, this is, yeah. So this is, um, maybe I'll write this as, Yeah, this is the problematic notation here. Um, I could have just skipped to um, just J, uh, this J sum summation notation. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so given these gamma IKs, you can think of them as uh, kind of your current, uh, it's the expected value of uh, this Z. So, so like if, again, if we're in this second spot here, uh, for instance, you're going to get, it's basically, it, it is a probability. It's, it's really the expected value, because this is a Bernoulli random variable. It's the posterior probability of z given rx. It's the posterior probability that x came from this Gaussian, is a way to think of it, right? Because z is the indicator of being in this Gaussian or not being from this Gaussian. And um, the expected value of Bernoulli is just the, prob the, prob the probability, right, of that um, thing being 1. And so this is uh, really the posterior probability that Xi came from the K Gaussian. That's what gamma IK is telling me. Okay. And again, it's with respect to at least my teeth iteration, what I think the parameters are of the teeth iteration. Now, given that, we basically just have to play the calculus trick of maximizing the Q function. Because it's it's just a uh, I hate of 
there. So I get uh, 1 over pi k um, sum of the gamma i k's over i uh, plus lambda. And I want to set this equal to 0. So I'm not going to uh, do the derivation of all of that. Um, but if, if 
looks exactly like how you get the mean as a maximization problem of the log Gaussian. And in the end, um, the updates for the mu uh, and the t plus one iteration is just uh, again the weight of the mean.
So if I run the Markov image, this is my posterior average after, this is not very many samples, I just did um, a quick 20 
again, again, you can be a, a little, a fairly, you know, quite a bit slower than this is fine. The real, the real thing is, I don't want to have to wait four minutes for everybody, everybody's assignment to, to run. Um, this, this long. And you know, even if it's a couple minutes or so, that's probably not too bad. A few minutes is not too bad. Just if you're on the order of tens of minutes, we've got a problem. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so let me just really quickly in the last five minutes we have um, give a uh, intro to uh, Gaussian processes. So what we're going to do for Gaussian processes is we're doing again regression, and we talked about in class so far uh, Bayesian uh, linear regression where you uh, you know, do lines or polynomials where um, you basically have polynomials as basis functions, and then we would have coefficients on those polynomials. Those coefficients just multiply linearly, and um, we put a prior on those coefficients. Now, the problem with all that is that we then, or we then talk about you can do model selection and choose the order of the polynomial and that kind of thing. And, and what we're going to do in processes is we're going to put a different prior on the space of functions that's going to give us much more flexibility than having to specify, okay, we want a polynomial basis. I could have chosen, you know, radial basis functions, or I could have chosen um, uh, sines and cosines as basis functions. So anyway, the point is, what if I don't want to choose the basis? And I don't want to be constrained, like, should, should I stop at 10th order polynomials or 20th order polynomials? Um, uh, what if instead we said, I want to be much more flexible, not choose a specific basis, but that I want some kind of smoothness in my functions. But I want to give them a lot more uh, flexibility to kind of do whatever they want. And that's kind of the, the idea of the Gaussian processes. Um, there's a really nice book that, uh, that uh, is posted, uh, it's, it's uh, online, all PDF from the chapters are online, that is posted for reading this week. Uh, so be sure to read uh, chapter two of that book this week. Um, and I'll just give an example of what these things look like. Let's see. Um, I think I have a, a, a prior function. And uh, we're basically you're going to see there's a there's a parameter that sh that's basically to tell us how smooth are our functions. Okay, and we'll explain this mathematically um, next week or no this week, but Thursday, sorry. Um, and if I start very with this printer very smooth, um, I get very, very smooth functions, uh, almost straight lines here. In fact, if I go high enough, I will get um, kind of straight lines. Um, but now if I bring it down smaller, I let these uh, functions have more variability to them. They don't have to be quite as con uh, constrained. Um, and then, uh, you know, 5. I should mention here, what I'm doing is I'm just sampling random functions. This is straight from the prior distribution uh, that Gaussian processes gives us. So Gaussian processes is, you can think of it as a prior distribution on the space of function. So it's a, the space of function um, basically is, again, an infinite dimensional space. So this is a prior on an infinite dimensional space. Um, and, and these are uh, just samples from that prior. Um, and I've got just one parameter that controls how smooth I want my functions to be, and so these are just kind of uh, some examples. So anyway, I, I keep bringing that down, and I can get more and more kind of uh, crazy functions. Are okay. They, are these like yeah. Brownian quotient functions? Uh, not quite, but they, they are a stochastic process, yeah. So you can think of it as a stochastic process. Can you think of it as stochastic? Yeah, you can think of it as a stochastic process, yeah. So if you, so if you know stuff about stochastic processes, you can think of it that way. Um, and there, there's a covariance function uh, in, in, in kind of uh, the x, or if you want to think of this time, the time parameter here. So yeah, so, so you can think of it as a stochastic process, yeah. Um, I, think if, I think if I take this all the way down, basically in the limit, as I take this parameter to zero, I think if the limit becomes a brand new motion, basically. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not So anyway, what we're going to do on Thursday is we're going to say, um, 
now use these, this Gaussian process as a prior to the function that I want to learn in a regression problem. So now let's say I'm just giving data, actual data points, x, y data points, like a scatter plot here, and I want to fit just one function through that data, but I still want to put a prior on the types of functions because I don't you know, just any old function. Uh, I want to say that function should be somewhat smooth. Uh, that's what we're going to do uh, with Gaussian processes. Okay, so anyway, uh, we'll pick back up on that first.